Misha, thanks for coming over so we could chat. Absolutely. <laughs> I was just thinking about that. We were reminiscing, right? That it's not the first time we've actually sat and talked about fights. I know. This has been a long journey, certainly far from over. So I appreciate you taking the time. I know yeah. you're very busy, mom life, fighter life. Um, but I want to start with this conversation going back to your roots because I always knew you were a high school wrestler. But I never quite knew how it came about. It was a unique choice at that time, certainly, for a female to join the wrestling team. I mean, what inspired that decision? Truthfully, I can't even say it was an inspiration. It was just more a lack of other opportunity, to be honest. Um, the only other female sport offered in the winter season in high school for me was basketball. And I just have never been drawn to basketball. You know, we all have those sports that we just don't care to play. Basketball is not my... You know, it's not my sport. <laughs> and, uh, you know, wrestling wasn't at first either. I mean, I think when I went in there, I learned very quickly that I was not good at it. And I, I had a lot to improve on, but I was very intrigued. I wanted desperately to get better at it because it was so tough that I thought, I can't get worse, so it can only get better. <laughs> <laughs> so that's kind of how I looked at it as a glass half full. And I, I, and I wanted to get better at it. I definitely wanted to try to master wrestling. And you wrestled all four years. I did. I wrestled all four years. So um, at one point I was the only female. So it was actually my best friend and I that joined together. So I kind of had her as my, uh, I, you know, she was my comrade in there. Yeah. It was just her and I <laughs> against the guys team. And they were certainly trying to get us to quit at first. I mean, they had had experience with other women coming on the team. And, you know, they kick them off after, you know, a week. The women just didn't last. And I think after a month they were like, oh, okay, they're here to stay. You know, and I remember my junior year, she wasn't able to wrestle and I kind of freaked out for a little bit. Like, what am I going to do? Like, I don't, you know, she's my partner. Or she's who I train with. But I think that really, that year really flipped a switch for me because I had to train only with the guys. And um, it really made me better. I started looking at what's the difference? Why are they better? You know, um, so I started thinking about, well, they're faster and they're stronger. Like maybe if I try to be really fast and I try to be as strong as I can, like I can get closer, right? I can narrow that gap. I'll just work really hard. So I, I was kind of forced to take those takeaways. You know, every day that I went to practice and I got my butt kicked, it was just <laughs> kind of like, but how can I get, a, you know, make that gap a little smaller? And that was really my goal through wrestling was just to make the gap a little smaller every yeah. practice that I went to. And, and I feel like I did that pretty well. So I was happy with it. I mean, how does, how do, we often hear about wrestlers that transition to fighting, but for you, how did you make that transition? How did fighting start to come into the picture for you? Fell into my lap, just like wrestling did. I think destiny has a way of seeking you out. And just if you're not afraid to listen or take chances, you might be really surprised like how your life takes that turn because Never in my wildest dreams growing up as a little girl did I ever think I would do a combat sport as my career choice, you know? It just didn't even cross my mind. I was pretty feminine growing up. I mean, I had a tomboy streak in me. I liked to climb trees. I liked to, you know, I was a very active child. But um, when I went to college after having wrestled, um, another friend of mine was like, hey, why don't you come check out this? MMA club sport and I didn't really know what MMA was and I thought it was karate and I was like nah I don't think so and she's like just just come you you're gonna love it I promise I like okay fine so I went and um, most of the guys there that were running the program fellow college kids themselves um, former wrestlers and then you know they started teaching me jujitsu and I was my mind was blown I was like what is this? <laughs> this is a great add-on to wrestling. I can choke people and right. like arm bar and <laughs> like all these great things. So I started learning that and I thought, okay, well, I can do that, but I have no interest in learning the striking. Don't even bother teaching me it. So I didn't, like I didn't, when I went to this mixed martial arts club sport, I kind of refused to learn the striking part at first because I was so not interested in fighting. I just thought it sounded like a terrible idea. I had no interest in getting hit in the face. And I was like, why would I want, I'm not an angry person. I don't need to hit anybody, you know? Like, that's how naive I was, sure. you know? I didn't understand that there was a sport to it, just like so many people, I think, at that time didn't understand. I wasn't familiar with the UFC. Um, I was 19 years old. I was just a girl just trying to have fun, play sports. I didn't want to, like, hurt anybody. Right. And um, then I went to watch my first amateur fight just a few weeks after having, you know, got this introduction to jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts. And I saw live fights for the first time and I was so inspired, just like a moth to a flame. I just thought, wow, that was incredible. And uh, the ref at that time 
made an announcement that in three weeks he was going to have his own local show and it was going to be all females. And mind you, this is at a time when it was hard to come across female fighters. For sure. So I think he was struggling to fill his fight card with females. So hence the call out to the audience. <laughs> yeah. So I just make my little happy ass down there and sign myself up with no uh, consulting of anybody. I didn't have a coach. I didn't have anything. So I, and three weeks later, I had my first fight. How'd it go? <laughs> How'd it go? Now that's the question. <laughs> Look, the first round went great. I fought a kickboxer, mm. um, Muay Thai specialist actually, and um, she's actually an instructor. She was really good on her feet, but she had no ground game. So right, so as soon as I got a hold of her and got her to the ground, it was totally my world. But I was literally just a wrestler with a little bit of jujitsu, so I almost forgot that I could even hit on the ground. You know, oh, I yeah, was trying sure. to pin her the whole time. You know. <laughs> So it was like two minutes or three minute round, something like that. I won the first round. Second round, I go out and uh, of course, I'm just going to try to take her down again. So, well, they had an answer for that. The second round was to, to get me in a tie clinch, oh. a Muay Thai clinch. And I didn't know what that was. And I certainly didn't know how to defend it. So then she just starts kneeing me in the face. And one of those caught me flush and just smashed my nose. I just heard the crunch. And I'm still just you know, vehemently trying to get through this to her legs. And uh, at some point we kind of get down to the ground, but she gets onto my back. And I still remember this moment very distinctly. It was a probably very pivotal moment for me in my fight career. It was like, I was on my, my hands and my, el my knees and my elbows, and she's trying to choke me. So I'm, uh, as I'm defending that, I'm thinking in this moment that I really finally understand what I'm here to do. And I'm watching a steady stream of blood pool and this blood puddle is literally just growing right in front of my face. I mean, I'm bleeding profusely at this point, but I finally understood I was there to fight. Now, this wasn't a wrestling match. I was here to fight and I needed to do that. And that's when I flipped the switch and I kind of started to buck her and she kind of fell down into the guard position. Then I stood up from the ceiling. I was just trying to reach for the ceiling and punch her as hard <laughs> as I could. And then I was like, now I know what I'm here to do. The round ends. Third round is coming in. My corner has just, they're all white as a ghost. I mean, they've never seen a female take that kind of damage. They're trying to stop the blood. They're not medical specialists. We didn't have cut men. Mind you, this was yeah. on a reservation. There was no medical there. There was you know, nothing like that. So they said, uh, we're not letting you go out for the third round. And I definitely was upset because I felt like I had finally understood what I was there to do. But I understood at the same time that this was uncharted territory. Sure. People just didn't know how to respond to this kind of thing. And I, they had my best interest in mind, right? I'm a poor college kid at the time. I didn't have money to go to the hospital. You still have to go to class. I yeah. still have to go to class. <laughs> like, I still, you know, so I think they were looking out for my best interest for sure. But um, so I walked away with that fight kind of feeling like I was cheated of that. You know, what I think I could have done in the third round. But I looked at, took that with a grain of salt and I said, you know what? I'm going to come back and I'm going to do this better. I definitely can't leave with that as being my, my one and only performance. I, I can do it better than that. I don't know what else after that, but I've got to do this at least one more time. And every time it was, you know, one more time, one more time. Yeah. But I came back and I won my next six fights in a row. And that was really exciting, especially because you come home and I had these two giant black eyes and my, I didn't even have the definition in my cheeks anymore because my nose was so swollen. It was just like out to here. I looked like a lion and a raccoon had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot of scrutiny at that time, right? Sure. A lot of scrutiny. My grandparents were in from out of town. My parents were trying to explain to them and they're just like, why would you let her? They're like, let her, you know? She's like, she just does what she wants. We don't want her to do this either. Nobody was on my side, really. I mean, nobody wanted me to continue doing that. I mean, my mom was there to support me. She supported me, but I think it was really hard for her. You know, there was, there was no future in this for women. Right. There absolutely was no, you know, profitability. There was no pro women. They just, it, it just wasn't a thing. Yeah, they were like, "What is this insane hobby you're doing?" Yeah. <laughs> Do you remember, like, you mentioned? Okay, this one wasn't really sanctioned. We don't have cut men. Do you remember? Did you have any fights in weird places? We've heard of rodeos and barns and these different spots. Like, did you have any of those experiences? 
Some, um, I think being on a reservation was one of the, the, the different places. Um, I fought outdoors before, right? Where like the mat was like really, really hot too. Oh they yeah, don't no. for the sun or anything <laughs> like that. So you, you got the hot feet going while you're trying to oh, fight. Yeah. Like lots of kicks, lots of kicks. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, not too interesting. I've heard of like dog kennels, like yeah, giant yeah, dog yeah. kennels. And I'm not quite that extreme. But okay, it, well good, I'm, I'm glad. I mean, yeah. you had to go <laughs> through some bullets, enough. I think. <laughs> <laughs> you had to go through enough. I mean, when you got to Strike Force, do you, well, first of all, how did that happen? And do you remember there being like a marked difference? Like, oh, wow, okay, this is, this is professional fighting. Yes. When I got my first fight in Strike Force was in 2008, and I was slated to fight Elena Beef Maxwell, and uh, beefy she was. I was fighting <laughs> up a weight class. She was the two time K1 world champion kickboxer under Kung Lee, and she was the hometown girl in San Jose. And I definitely felt like I was brought in to lose, clearly. Um, but I'm down for a good spoiler, you know? You're Misha Tate, I yes. like to spoil surprises, <laughs> and I, I like to be underestimated. I, I can always appreciate that, you know? So I came into that, and um, it was my first taste of a real professional experience. So I showed up, and I ended up winning that fight. I almost armbarred her in the first round. It was really close to, a, to an armbar finish, but we ran out of time. Mind you, this is when women were still not allowed to fight five minute rounds. We were only allowed to fight three minute rounds. So I didn't quite get that finish, but I did end up getting the takedowns and I won a decision for my first fight and that's when Strikeforce signed me. And that was the beginning of my, my career, really. That's when I started to think, oh, maybe I could do this instead of work a job. And it took I, until Strike Force for that. It took until Strike Force for that. Wow. Before that was just a hobby. I was just kind of scraping by. You know, I I, I wanted to to take this sport to a, to another level, but I didn't know like I didn't see a future or a path. I didn't there was there wasn't really a way. And it wasn't until I saw um, I saw Gina Carano fight Elena Maxwell on Strike Force and then when I got the call to fight Elena Maxwell, I thought, well that's where it's at. I mean, that's as big as it gets. Um, so I was just trying to take that career to, to as big as it gets, but, you know, women hadn't even fought, you know, on a, it wasn't even on Showtime yet at that time. Wow. So it was still, yeah, it was still a long way off from me being able to look at this and say, oh, this will be a career for me. You know, this was like, I think I can get by and not work and do this. So I'm, I'm going to do that because that's what makes me really happy. And this is where my passion is at clearly, but it was a, a clear glass ceiling that didn't know how I was going to get around that. <laughs> wow. I mean, do you remember at any point in your strike force career because you had a beautiful strike strike force career? But do you remember at any point when you were like, "Oh my god, I can make a living this way. Um, I'm being treated like the males on these cards because again, you said the difference in rounds, the difference in where the fights are airing. Do you remember sort of those transitional phases as well to the more positive uh, steps? Yes, I remember watching Gina and Cyborg fight as the first female main event and that was so powerful for me because they headlined over the men and it was just an absolutely you know it was an amazing fight and I think so many women were inspired but especially me coming up through the rankings just being a newly signed to strike force saying like wow there's a way I think there there's a future in this and it wasn't too long after that until I was fighting for the strike force title against Marlis Kunin another veteran of the sport oh, yeah. and I uh, was the co-main event to Dan Henderson and Fedor Emelianenko, huge fans of both of them. So, I mean, just to be the fight before them was so exciting for me. And I thought, wow, when I, when I won that title and I had got to fight on a big, you know, big platform for me at the time, I thought, I think I'm, I'm going all in on this. Like, I'm, I'm here to stay <laughs> and I'm not doing anything else. I just want to train, I want to fight, and I want to be the best. Well, we're so glad you did because we eventually saw the transition of the Strike Force fighters over to the UFC roster. We saw women join the UFC roster. And you coached the Ultimate Fighter, which was a huge platform in the, the ratings of the show at that time. And everyone who was tuning in and the storylines everyone was following, it was massive. Mm -hmm. When you reflect upon that experience, I mean, what comes to mind? And, and is it different than maybe how you immediately felt about it after? Well, I remember watching the first fight in the UFC, and, and I remember getting the call actually from Dana. And, and you know, after I had, I lost my title, but it was such a good fight that it put on 
you know, it, it kind of changed the mind of the UFC. Were they going to take women along the ride because they were buying the UFC out? It was really uncertain times for women and all the Strike Force fighters. Um, we really weren't sure what was going to go on. But Dana called me and he gave me a really fat bonus. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and I was like, that's a really good sign. <laughs> and it was, for me at the time, it was life-changing money. You know, I was a broke fighter. I was still trying to just get by, but I had given everything that I had to this sport. I mind you, I was living in a 22-foot RV, uh, you know, at Dennis Hallman's property, just trying to wow. train. And, you know, I couldn't afford the luxuries of an apartment. I would have had to work. So it was just train every day, all day, and get as much out of this as we can. So when I got that check, it just really kind of turned things around for me. And I thought, I'm going to be able to invest a little bit in myself. Like, I might actually be able to put a real roof over my head. Like, go figure. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then you see women getting into the OC, and I knew that that was what was next for me as well. And, I mean, your first ever UFC fight, do you remember the emotions walking out? I was so excited for my first UFC fight. I remembered hearing Kat Zingano warming up, and I could tell, like, her emotion was high, too. You know, I mean, she was just hitting the pads and screaming with everything she had, and, you know, I'm doing the same thing right back. And like, I can do that, too. Yeah, <laughs> and it was such a charge. I just remember feeling so ready for that and so at home and so happy just to be there and have that experience and I just wanted to you know make heads roll and you know I unfortunately didn't win that fight either but I think it was you know it was a great fight and, and I take so much away especially in hindsight from those losses like I, I, I don't need all wins in my career I'm so glad I had those losses to reflect on those are the ones that really are character building right because that's what you have to come back from winning is easy Losing is where growth is forced to happen. Yeah. No, exactly. And I mean, and we saw your growth. We continued to see your growth and evolution inside the Octagon. And we got to see you win the UFC world title. I mean, UFC 196 was a life-changing moment for you. Um, you know, the performance was beautiful. I remember after you hugging Coach Robert Falls. I remember yeah. those moments. And I know how pivotal they are still to this day in your life. But when you reflect upon UFC 196, I mean, what are the memories that first come to mind? When I reflect on UFC 196, the memories that first come to mind, um, it, it first, it's a flood of emotions, right? Because I remember looking at myself in the mirror before walking out and saying, this is the last time that you will look at yourself and not be a UFC world champion. I just knew I was going to go out there and I was going to find a way to get it done. And I remember the walkout. I remember the charge from the crowd. It's like, it's literally, I'm getting goosebumps right now. Like, I just, I feel that still, still in my heart. Like, I know that's where I'm supposed to be. And, you know, having Robert Follis in my corner, you know, rest in peace. I miss him dearly. And I wish he was here on the second chapter of my career, but I hope I'm making him proud, you know, from above. But those emotions that you just carry, those partnerships, like, they're, they matter so much. And I, I look back at that with the fondest of memories. I really do. And the win that I got that night, you know, come from behind to win in the fifth round, I feel like was so symbolic of my whole career. It was just a struggle to get to that point, but finding a way to win anyways. And showing the world how tough you are and really showing that if you keep at it, there will be a way because there was a time where you're fighting, you're getting punched in the face and breaking your nose, and there's not even an opportunity for you to compete for five minutes, let alone for a UFC world title with a nice fat check at the end. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. In a nutshell, that's exactly it. I had perspective that, that really made me appreciate those moments. It was about 10 years, almost to the, to, almost to the day, Wow. since I had my very first fight to actually becoming a UFC world champion. So yeah, it was a lot of sacrifice, a lot of effort to get there. And, and truthfully, there, I didn't have a clear vision when I started this. There was no path to being a UFC world champion. So it was just progressions that I, that I continued to take risks throughout my career and, and gamble on myself, you know, double down and, and just try to make the way, keep breaking glass ceilings. Well, you certainly did it all. I want to talk about, you mentioned you learned from losses, and we certainly have to to mention UFC 200. It wasn't the way you wanted it to go. You guys were elevated to the main event. You're fighting Amanda, and things don't go your way, but you handled it so well, and you communicated your feelings and thoughts in such a professional manner that I feel like even through a loss, everyone gained so much even more respect for you after that. Oh, I appreciate that. You know, I've tried to always be an open book because that's all we can do as as humans. You know, we, we're, I mean, fighting is, 
is a really tough sport. It's very demanding physically, mentally, emotionally, and, and, it, and it, it takes so much from you. So um, you have to be in a place to be able to give all of yourself. And I can't say that I was always in that position to give all of myself, but I think I learned a lot about, you know, finding that happy medium and, and finding a good place of solace and peace and stability in my life. And I wasn't in the most stable position going into those, a lot of my fights, but um, I was proud of myself for, for persevering when I could and, and learning from the losses and just trying to give people what I could. Yeah. There is without a doubt, uh, no question that you're a pioneer in this sport. You're a pioneer for not just mixed martial arts, but specifically women's MMA. And you've made such an evolution to people. You've, you've helped young girls see a future now for themselves in the sport. And a lot of that was brought to light with this rivalry with Ronda Rousey. A lot of eyeballs were on The Ultimate Fighter, were on your fights. What sort of thoughts does it evoke in you when you reflect upon that time in your life for not just yourself, but also for the sport? I look at it so differently this time around because I was in the middle of it and I don't think I could appreciate it for what it truly was. Because um, I was really focused on the rivalry and the, the true dislike that we had for each other. But now I look at it and I say, I'm just so grateful. I'm really grateful to have had somebody like Rhonda as that foe. You know, it, it needed two parts. We needed that to make people care beyond just a sport, right? There was a storyline to follow and it went for, you know, went on and like, who knows? Like maybe, you know, after she has kids, she'll want to come back <laughs> and fight again. Who knows? Like that would be a dream come true. But honestly, I look at it so different. I'm just so, so thankful to have that, right? Um, not just maybe what it did for the sport, but I could truthfully say from my firsthand perspective what it did for me. It did amazing things, and she was the, the perfect person to have standing across the way from me. It was always so incredible to watch, but was it, were there days where it was really challenging to have that sort of rivalry? Every day was very challenging to have that kind of rivalry because I, I had so much that I put on my plate already, so many other battles that I was already trying to fight, that adding one more, especially so big and in front of the rest of the world, was just a little, it was a little too much, I think. I look at myself and I don't think I was really able to put my best foot forward because I was so buried under the pressure and emotions and you know, trying to compartmentalize the best that I can. I'm trying to suppress the best that I can. But, uh, you know, I wasn't only fighting Rhonda. I wasn't only fighting, you know, my personal life. You know, I wasn't only fighting myself. And, and you just can't do that and be the best version of yourself. You've got to pick the focus and you need to have the other things be kind of quiet in your life so that you can really harness and give everything that you have. And I think when I look at myself and the storyline of my life, it was always in spite of you know, that I was kind of addicted to that adversity. I, I needed that to, I had to get through that adversity and that's how I won. And now I look at it and I'm like, what if I never needed any of that? What if I just took that out of my life and allowed myself to be the very best version so I don't have to have all these little micro fights before I get to the big fight? What if I could just show up to the big fight and everything else has been great and I've actually been able to channel all of myself for the fight? And that's kind of where I'm at now, is that that perspective change, you know? And, and it's given a lot, a lot of power to me. How did you come to that realization and when did you come to it? So I retired after losing to Raquel. And in that fight, I realized that the flame was out, that I wasn't there, I really wasn't present in that fight. Um, and I knew that I didn't ever want to feel like that in a fight again. And I wasn't sure that I could ever fight again and have a real fire or feel differently because it had been on this downhill trend for quite some time. And the flame was finally completely out and I said, I'm hanging up the gloves, I'm done, I'm never gonna fight like that again. It was a really piss poor performance. I feel like my fans didn't deserve it, I feel like my corner, people invested the time in me. And so I walked away from the sport just thinking I'm never doing that again, ever. I never want to feel like that again. It was awful. And um, I took, you know, four plus years to find myself, you know? What, is, what, is, what, what else makes me happy? You know, who am I besides Misha Tate, the fighter? And I had a bit of an identity crisis for a while because I had no answers to those kinds of questions and the insecurity became very prominent in my life very quickly. It's like, I don't know what I am without this sport. 
So in the process of me discovering that, finding true love, having my two children, understanding a different dynamic to the kind of relationships that you can have, rekindling the relationship with my family, and getting myself away from toxicity in my life has elevated me in so many ways that now it's like I can truthfully say I can put my best foot forward. I, I mean, it's inspiring to hear, Misha, and as someone who's known you for so long, it's, it's emotional almost to like know you were struggling like that and to finally see you be so free and so happy. It's, it's really, um, you know, eliciting an emotional response for me. But, you know, during those years, do you, did you get the desire to train? Did you get the, oh, what if, what if I could fight? Or were you completely shut out of the sport? Were you like, I don't even want to watch fights? I just didn't even allow it to cross my mind, honestly. I just put it so far out of my mind. I said, no, I'm never doing it again. I shut the door on it. I said, it's done. And it's done. And um, I think I needed to push that the furthest away from me so that it could have time to rekindle and rebuild. And that and I think that now, because of that, the fire burns brighter than ever. It wasn't until I was going to have my, my second child, my son. It was just, just before that. I was like nine months pregnant. And I was like, in the middle of the pandemic, you know, at one of those low points. I think we all experienced low points through the pandemic, right? We all oh, experienced yeah. that where it's like the sport was finally completely gone out of my life. There were no live shows. I couldn't even watch a live event <laughs> on TV. It, the gyms were shut down. I couldn't you know, even hit mitts if I wanted to kind of thing. For the first time, I started to really reflect on what the sport actually meant to me. And when I started to think about that and value um, the, the things that are most important to me, right? Family and friends, time, and dreams, dreams and goals. Those were the three that checked my list and I said you know I've got it made in my personal life I'm finally in a great place what else do I want it's like well I've got a little time left if I wanted to come back I, I've got time you know um, and what are my dreams and goals what do I want to make out of the the rest of my story and I thought I want to fight again was the goal to just have one fight was the goal to eh, have a couple see how it goes was the goal the belt um, the goal is always the belt. When I, when I come back to fight, it, it, it was never just a one fight thing. You know, I did understand that maybe I would come back and I would hate it. You know, I would try one fight and you, you never know, right? right? Right now I have that perspective. It's like you never know how life is going to be and how you truly are going to feel after an experience. But my mindset going into that was absolutely that I wanted to become the best in the world again. And I thought I was never able to deliver the best version of me. You know, um, so I'm proud of my achievements. I was proud at that point, but I also feel like it was so far from finished, so far from what I could have actually done that I think in the second point that I can maybe show the world, that's my goal. I want to show the world the best version of me. Well, so far you certainly have, uh, you defeated Marianne. It looks like an easy night at the office for you making the walk, even during preparation and camp. Did you feel different? Did it feel the same, like, oh, okay, this is my old routine, or did, was it a completely new experience? It was like being reborn. Completely new experience, completely different camp. It was so stress-free. It was so, um, and I'm not saying it wasn't hard, you know, because being a mom and being a fighter is definitely challenging, but it was so fulfilling. You know, when my kids, I walk in the door and they're both, they just like suction to me, mommy, 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 mommy. And sometimes I'm like, I just, I need to get some water. I need to eat. Hang on a second. I'll be right there. But they love me so much and I love them so much that it's just like, how could I not be more grateful to be in the position that if nothing else in the world went right for me and I have those two beautiful children and my fiance and my family, like all is right with the world. So I have peace and some kind of like real stability in my life that just gives me that, it, it makes me more dangerous than ever before. Because having that stability means that my world's no longer doing this as I'm trying to catch my balance and focus on all these different things. Like it, it's like a calm sea that I can just go out there and wreck shop. And that's what I wanna do. So, you know, I got that win over Mari and Renault. That was, that was big for me because after almost five years off, a lot of people really they weren't sure what to expect. Right. And they doubted whether I would come in and win. I think I was almost 50-50. I was barely a favorite in that fight. Um, 
so and nobody was like taking bets on me, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I feel like, um, you know, I had a lot to prove in that first fight, but I've got a lot more to prove and a lot more ground to cover, and that's what I'm here to do. You're here, and you're gonna face Ketlin, uh, Ketlin Vieta next. When you were offered that name, I mean, were you like, okay, just a couple more fights to the belt, or were you like, okay, we'll just see what comes from this one? What was your mindset? Uh, my mindset was a little more planned from the very beginning. I always thought it would be about two to three fights till I got to the belt before I even knew Mariam was going to be my first opponent. So I had her as a fight, and I say, obviously, things can change. Now I have perspective in my life, but I know that. <laughs> sure. Right? We can never be too sure of the future, and that's why we love fighting, right? Because truthfully, never know what's going to happen. So it, that's what makes it so exhilarating and so fun. But I go out there, I got that win over Marion, and I said, okay, now I want to fight somebody, you know, where I'm going to continue to climb the rankings. Um, but I was like, but I don't want to jump the gun. You know, I don't want to be disrespectful to the division. I think I also need to do exactly what's right for me. So for the first time, it's, it's taken into consideration what myself and my family needs first, and everything else will come into place. So I'm not rushing things and I'm not going to waste time either. So everything when this happens will all be according to when it's supposed to happen. And I, that's just the way I believe it's intended to be. So we're going to fight Ketlin Vieira next and uh, with proper progression in the rankings. She's ranked number seven right now. And uh, I think a win over her, a good dominant finish will boost me into the top five. I love that. Are you enjoying training? I love training. Training for the first let me tell you this before I retired training became like an I have to do oh I have to go to training you know I've been laying around all day and it's finally three o'clock and I'm like oh and I'm still somehow late to practice you know because <laughs> it's like I've been doing nothing all day but waiting for training <laughs> and it just like was like sucking the life out of me you know and I, I just I couldn't appreciate it anymore because I was just in a depression I was in a funk I was just kind of like I was so out of it that it was just the thing I had to show up to do um, and I just wasn't putting my best foot forward because I didn't have it to give. And when I look at my training now, it's like the peace in my life. You know, like my kids are so fun, but there's their chaos. You know, I have a three-year-old, I have a one-year-old, I don't sit down. It's very busy when I, you know, when I, whenever I'm in the house, you know, it's mommy, 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 mommy. <laughs> so I go to training and I'm like, ah. Oh, this is so nice. I appreciate it with a whole new light that this is like my peace. I get to get away from the house, away from the kids, and I get to do my time. So that's, that is my, my time now. And it's not I have to, it's I get to. It's a very different mindset going into practice with an I get to as opposed to oh, I've got to do this today. Right. No, absolutely. And I think anyone in any walk of life can appreciate that sort of mindset for whatever they do. Um, when you are, especially in the gym, uh, Extreme Couture has so many talents, you know, young fighters, veteran fighters. Do you ever think about the impact you've had on all of them, the impact you've had on the sport, the way you truly are a pioneer? Does that, do you ever allow that into your, your mind and heart? I, I think I struggle with that, to think that what I've done may, might have like influenced other women to do it because it's, it's, I don't really sit back and spend time thinking about that truthfully. I just try to do what I can to move forward and I'm always trying to, to help. You know, I have a kind of a nickname around the gym is Mama Misha. And I've had that <laughs> nickname prior to having kids because I just kind of want it. I know the struggles. I know firsthand what it's like to be that young, hungry, up and coming fighter. You know, the amateur fighters who they're not getting paid and they just show up every day and they're working so hard and they're trying to cover as much ground as they can. I'm like, I was there once. I know that spot. Can I help you? <laughs> like, what do you, what can I do? What can I help? Can it, whether it's just insight, whether it's, you know, do you need a, a room? Are you transitioning into Vegas? You know, it's like those kinds of things because I know those made all the difference for me when I was coming up. You know, when Dennis Hallman opened up his property to us, let, let me put a 22-foot RV and stay there and train 24-7. I mean, that's the kind of camaraderie, and I think you got to pay it forward, right? Because people did a lot for me, so I try to, try to help when I can, but when I look at maybe the impact, I, I have trouble grasping, I guess, maybe, if, yeah, if it made that much of a difference or if it didn't, I, I don't know. People tell me that it did. It did. Yeah. It did. So. I mean, even for someone like me who got to interview, you know, these up and coming women in the sport, 
and be a part of those interviews. And then people are going, I want to watch Misha Tate because she's coaching the Ultimate Fighter and I love it. <laughs> and then someone like me is asking the questions. It only helps me. So you open doors for people you might not even realize, but we're all appreciative. Mm -hmm. And I know you're not one to reflect upon it, but when someone like me has to ask questions about it, I appreciate your humbleness, but it's what makes you pioneers in the sport so incredible. And it's why we are so fortunate to work with you and, and to watch you compete. Misha, you've been so open with everything. Before I let you go, I want to ask you one question. I kind of want you to just like finish the sentence. 10 years ago, Misha Tate was, and in 10 years, Misha Tate will be. Oh gosh. 10 years ago, Misha Tate was trying to find herself, really unsure of the world, but just willing to take risk and trying to claw my way to somewhere. Didn't even know where that was. And in 10 years, Misha Tate will be the best version of Misha Tate. I will be complete with everything that I've built my life around. That's what I'll be, I'll be complete. I feel pretty complete now, but I still got things I wanna check off the list. And I think in 10 years, those things will be checked off. So I'll be complete. Well, let's not wait 10 years to have this conversation again. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> You're the best, Misha. Nothing but the very best of luck in every aspect of life. You are a true pro and it's always an honor and a pleasure. Thanks. Thanks.